class, if any of you all come, we pray for different people. And, uh, we ask the Lord to uh, just bless and intercede. And uh, my prayer, praise the Lord, my prayer, I had a prayer that I asked the uh, People are saying they can't hear me. Uh, the Lord answered my prayer. I asked you all a couple of Sundays to pray for me. And I know God is good because he answered that prayer. And he didn't have to answer it the way I thought. I wanted it to happen one way. But sometimes God comes in another way. But I just kept praying. I guess I, I took that issue and I, I laid it at his feet. And I said, Lord, I'm tired of wrestling with this. And I know you can handle it. I know you can ask a prayer. And he answered my prayer. And I'm th I thank God I'm out of that, that issue right now. I know I may go in another one. But I'm just thanking God because I know God is good. Anybody else know God is good?
couldn't get well. But Jesus healed my body. And now I'm able to tell. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. Mighty good. present the gospel, a messenger of the king. Thank you. Introduction. As the choirs were singing, uh, he been good, mighty, mighty good. Well, we want to bring that up to present tense and future tense. He been good. He is good, and he always will be good. The Bible say in the book of Romans 8:18 8, 8, that I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, he said, in everything give thanks. But this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. My friends, if you have been born again, it doesn't make any difference what your circumstances in life might be. You have many things to be thankful for. And we are so grateful. To the pastor in his absence, uh, and to my pulpit contemporaries, deacons, trustees, members, and friends, I am indeed grateful to God <clears throat> for this opportunity to stand here this morning and to share with you a portion of God's word. I always use the statement, a portion. I could stand here for three or four hours and not be able to tell it all. But God is a good God. We want to be in much prayer for Pastor Bonham. We are always grateful to God for the knowledge that he continued to give men and women about the frail bodies of ours. But healing have to come from God. And I just love when I hear a doctor says, is in the hands of the Lord. He is really realizing that his shortcoming, but God have the final say so. We are so thankful. This week, I've been just about glued to the television because of what is going on out there in uh, Ferguson. And knowing some things about the Word of God and realize that in our government system, it's not against the law to offer pre a peaceful protest. But when we start dealing with anarchy, Satan is stepping in. We ought to always remember that human government was created by God. In the book of Genesis, when God, uh, after the flood, when uh, God next chapter created human government. He created a system and God did not uh, give any particulars about what type of government that man was going to set up. 
For whatever he was going to be scattered at the table of Tower of Babel, mankind have set up some form of government because God didn't want mankind to live whom he created to live in a chaotic situation where there was no laws. That is the reason why there are many nations in this world, but no nations have the same, two nations have the same form of government. They might be similar, but they are different. God didn't tell man what type of government but he wanted mankind to be set up in a government where men and women could rule men and women. What do you think it would be like if there were no form of government? The only government that God created was to the nation Israel. In the book of Exodus, Genesis, uh, Exodus uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, God set up a system that his chosen nation, Israel, to live by. And he intended for them to have a theocracy form of government. Well, you might say, what is a theocracy form of government? That is a government where God wants to be their king. And he was going to deal with the Jews through the prophets and priests. But in the book of 1 Samuel, when Samuel chose to his two sons and whom he, Samuel was a man that was dedicated to doing the Lord's will, but Samuel did not train his two boys. And he anointed them priests without consulting God. And those were some rascals. Disobeying the word of God, living in sin. Then the people tell Samuel, give us a king. We want to be like other nations who have a king that go to war and a king that they could see. Samuel consulted God and God has Samuel understand, they have not rejected you, but they rejected me. So give them a king, but tell them what the king is going to require. Samuel informed them, but they said, we want a king. God did not allow his chosen peoples to have a complete monarch form of government. When the kingdom was divided, the northern kingdom, Israel, they had a form of monarch. Coups take over. It didn't follow a bloodline. But the tribe of Judah in Israel, they had God allowed them to have a king, but he never did allow them to have a monarch. He chose who he wanted to be, the king from a bloodline. You say, well, what they have that got to do with us today? As I speak to you today, and talking about the condition out there in Ferguson, and looking at what the Word of God says, and what should our attitude be? What is our fault? From the word of God, we're going to see there are three big issues to, that I think that we as black peoples is ignoring. And that is salvation. We must learn how to put the Lord Jesus Christ first. Salvation. And then teach the Christian how to obey the word of God. Yeah. Second, we're going to see from the word of God that where we are lacking so far in is our youth being educated. We're going to see from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote this fourth chapter of Ephesians, he was in jail, house arrest. But he had uh, wrote to the church as he had given them all that doctrine in the first three chapters. And from four through six, he gave them practical application, what you should do with what you have learned in the first three chapters. And he going to see, we're going to see from scripture 
He said, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hand, doing that which is good, that he might have to give to them that need it. God want his people to get a good circular education. Too many of our young people are not taking advantage of doorways of opportunity. And we're going to see that everybody is not college material. But you can go to trade school and learn a trade. The time is over to walk into an employment office and say, give me a job. The issue is, what are you trained to do? Many of our young people just dropping out of school. They don't see the necessity, but they want the clothes. They want the cars. They want the money. But they're not willing to take a trade. When I was pastoring, this is my issue in dealing with the young people. Then number three, now there are many issues where we are failing, but the third issue in my book is we fail to vote. We fail to vote. Working on a poll for many a years and seeing what, how few black people go to the polls to vote. So today, we're going to be dealing with three issues, and we want you to write them down. Now, there are many contributing problems that we go through, but salvation is number one. Falling out of school and no training is a big issue among the blacks. Listen to what is going on there at Ferguson. They're talking about the poverty and how many black people that uh, 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 is out of work. And then number four, number three, from reading the paper and, and uh, listening to the news, Ferguson have more blacks than whites. And if you're talking about injustice, then why is that so? If those that are in office had to get there by votes, and what are you complaining about if you don't vote? There is no sense in complaining about people being prejudiced. Let me tell you something. There will never be utopia here on this earth. There are always going to be prejudice. Jesus Christ did not come into this world to change society. Jesus Christ came into the world to save souls. And once souls have been changed, then that will make a difference. But there will never be more saved people than there are unsaved. Salvation. Jobs. What can you do? And voting. I am going to say some things today and it seems like you might think that I am boasting. But everything I'm going to say is how the Lord used me. I have documentation from three newspapers, I mean two newspapers. God sent me to be a pastor of a church in Mount Vernon, Illinois. I never did put in a resume. They heard about me and they called me and asked me, would I come and preach for them? I went and preached. My wife and I walked in the church that Sunday morning and one of the elder ladies said, that's our pastor. I never did fill out a resume. They never did contact Pastor Bonner or anyone in President Green. And we're going to see when God sends he sends in many different ways. But the scripture says, wherever there, his church need a pastor, 
God is going to send someone that is qualified to teach and be a pastor. And we're going to see what that word pastor means. When I think about what's going on out there in Ferguson, and they're talking about last week they put cameras in police cars. Here, two newspapers wrote about the work that I'd done in Mount Vernon. I only have showed this to two people that I'm aware of right now, Deacon um, Robbins and Pastor Bonner. If you go to Mount Vernon and the police have cameras in their cars, I am the one who is responsible for those cameras being in the car. God used me in many ways that I did not go there expecting to get involved. I would like for uh, you to turn to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And we're going to read from verses uh, 4, 11, I mean 11 through 14. And then the 28th verse. And then 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. Our responsibility. The pastor responsibility. The book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Verses 11 through 14, and then the 28th verse. And then 1 Timothy, the second chapter, Brad Bonner hit on this last week about the power of prayer. Okay, verses 1 through 4. Pay your close attention to the words. When the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesian, this is called one of his prison epistles. He was in jail. And he would write into the church at Ephesus about how to live in a sin-sick world and still representing the Lord. The 11th verse says, when he was getting ready to go back to heaven, he gave men gifts to carry on the work that he started. And some of these gifts are signed gifts because the word of God was not completed. It says that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long, Paul? Until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth from now on be no more children tossed about to and fro uh, with every wind of doctrine, by the sled of men hands, sleight of men hands, cunning crafty, whereby they wait, what they lie and wait to deceive. Let us go over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy was written about uh, four, three or four years after the Apostle Paul had wrote 1 Timothy. Paul had been to this Roman tribunal with the charges that they brought against him in the book of Acts. He was under house arrest. But he had, the trial had been over. He had been found innocent and set free. Now he had left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to be the pastor and a young man. And this is called one of his pastoral epistles. He had four. Now he writes into Timothy he'd been released. Notice the first four verses. I exalt therefore that first of all, notice first of all, by supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. First of all, pray. Pray for kings and all of those who are in authority over, uh, are in authority. That we, Christians, might 
uh, lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is uh, the, uh, good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You may be seated. Pray for kings. God instituted human government. Now God having Paul to write as he had been free to tell the church, Timothy, you are a young man, a young pastor, but I want you to pray, have the church to pray for all of those who are in authority. Pray that we might live a quiet, peaceful life. The word of God was concerned about external uh, 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 terrorism. You see what is going on over there in the Middle East today, the Isaac, uh, and the uh, government today, all this week, they think that the sleeper cell is already here in the United States of America terrorists from outside. And then he said, pray that we might have a peaceful life, be concerned about internal anarchy. Then he says, pray that all men be saved. Pray that the king. There are many government officials that do not know the Lord. And there never will be a time when everyone in government will be a Christian. Eh? A Christian can have a possible chance of being elected on a lower level. But as the uh, uh, office and uh, uh, spread for more voters, you see that here in the city of St. Louis, it wouldn't be too impossible for an ordinance in an over small territory to run and win and talk about the Lord. But when you go citywide and you're dealing with more unsaved peoples, it gets harder. When you go statewide, it's not about impossible for a person to talk about the Lord and going to church and living a Christian life to be elected because there are so many more people that only want to hear about the Lord. And when you go federal-wide, it is just about impossible. because the politician is going to appeal to the one they're going to get the votes from. And many a time our politician, when they get in office, they, will, they forget about the Lord because they want to be re-elected. Go back to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And therefore, from the reading of those scriptures, we want you to write down three words. And those three words are what the world needs now, in particular black peoples. We need salvation, we need jobs, and we need to vote. Let him that stole steal no more. Stealing was a common thing ever since God created man. Robbery. You remember in the Bible about the Emmaus Road? In the book of Ezra, the eighth chapter, when Ezra made his second trip to uh, Jerusalem, after he had made the first one, he went back to Babylon, the king of Persia. And he wanted to stay longer, and the king gave him all of the vessel that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple. He gave him much silver and gold. The people gave him a dough that did not want to go back to Jerusalem and live. They gave him a lot of money. And when Ezra and several thousand of people got ready to leave, Ezra says he was ashamed to ask the emperor for a military escort 
because he had been bragging to the king about the power of their God and how he would protect them. And now he wanted to go and it was a shame. How strong is your faith? Ezra will not accept, even though there were a lot of bandits on the road, but God protected them and they didn't lose anything. When in the book of Ephesians here, when it says that uh, God gave gifted men to the church, and he said, teacher, pastor, okay? When you look at this word from the Greek, this is the reason why I love the King James Bible. I'm prejudiced to it. Because the King James James will make you get to your concordance and go back and see what these words were translated from the Greek to the English. When you read the Bible and it talk about a pastor, uh, the first thing that it is going to talk about uh, a shepherd. And a shepherd had the responsibility of leading the sheep. A Middle East sheep was different from a Mississippi sheep. You couldn't, you couldn't send a sheep dog at a Middle East sheep. You couldn't drive them, you had to lead them. But when you study this word from the Greek, it said that uh, 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 the pastor not only mean a shepherd, but it also mean a point man. A military example of a captain, sergeant, Leading an army, a bunch of men, and he is the point man walking out front, not knowing what and he is going to encounter. But the soldiers follow the point man. Christianity is a life that none of us have lived before. Even the pastors of a church. Being a pastor, they come and kind of, first of all, they know that the number one job is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But every pastor has uh, uh, come in with some things that they didn't anticipate. And being a pastor, the point man. So the Greek says the point man and the shepherd are the same. And that is the pastor. When I, now notice he says, whenever his church need a pastor, he is going to send someone that is qualified to teach and to shepherd or be the point man. And like we said, no one can pastor and no one in advance all the issues that they're going to face. When God, the Baptist, we are what is called free autonomy. We don't have a senate to send us a pastor like the Methodist, Presbyterian. We are free autonomy. You know our system for electing our own pastor. And what the word of God is saying, whenever the church of God need a pastor, the spirit of God is going to send somebody, I don't care how many resumes you have. There's going to be some of my resumes that the spirit of God send. But the church have to live in a manner being led by the spirit of God so you will know. And you will be able to vote in our system whom the Spirit of God has sinned. But if you are not being led by the Spirit, you're going to vote to what somebody else tell you who to vote for. God has many different ways. What am I saying? When the church in Mount Vernon needed a pastor, I was not looking for to be a pastor, but they heard about me and they sent me, they called me and asked me to come and preach. I went and I preached. They set up another invitation a few weeks later for me to go back and preach again. A few Sundays later, the first Sunday, they had me to come over, issue communion, do the baptizing, and preach. A couple months later, without me even putting in a resume, I never did ask to be the pastor. They voted for me to be the pastor. 
I knew that my primary job was to preach and teach the word of God, telling men and women about the saving power of Jesus Christ. But being the point man, there were some things that went along with being a pastor that I wasn't aware of in that situation. When I read about Ferguson and how they are complaining about the attitude of the police and how the police have no respect for the blacks. And yet and still, the black is in a minority. When I went to Mount Vernon, there was not a black policeman, a black farmer, a black sheriff. There was no one and any form of judicial order was black. The policemen in the streets had no respect and no love for the blacks. And the blacks had no love, particularly younger generation, for the policemen. It was a chaotic situation. But since God sent me there, hear me closely, I built up a great relationship with the mayor, with the uh, police chief and his wife, with the city fireman, with the jailer. I was the only black and a member, a part of the Jefferson County Ministerial Alliance. The city of Mount Vernon would have been arguing for years about a street for Dr. Martin Luther King. And I got involved. And the street was changed in my name, well, I mean, because of the work I'd done. And I have pictures here that since the church that I was pastoring on the corner of 10th and Newby, going through the heart of Mount Vernon, and when they decided, which I pushed for Newby, I mean, uh, my, uh, 10th Street. And they decided because of the work that I had done, I would be a part of the celebration that Saturday morning. And I have pictures here from the newspaper where I was on the flatbed of a, of a, a, a lift truck putting up the sign. I didn't go there for that. But that was part of the problem. I began to set up a quarterly meeting with the neighborhood. I had the chief police, the sheriff, the jailer as a panel. The blacks in Mount Vernon had never had an opportunity to speak their opinion about the way they were being treated by the police on the street. They felt intimidated. But those meetings gave them the opportunity to come and express themselves. And, and always in the meeting, there was the mayor, there was the city judge, there was uh, 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 many of the white pastors. And because of that meeting, three or four of those meetings, and they was complaining about what the policeman did to them, the police on the street said it was not true. I asked the question to the mayor and the police chief. If you had cameras in your cars, wouldn't that eliminate some of the argument of who is lying and who is telling the truth? And the mayor says, Reverend Armstrong, you might have something there, but we never thought about it. And I asked the question trying to tie them down. I say, well, if you had the cameras, and the cameras be activated when? When you turn the siren on? or uh, when you uh, turn your light on. He said, well, they all be tied together. I said, well, would there be any reason for the policeman to deactivate the camera before the situation is settled? And they say, no. He said, but you know you got a point. At the next council meeting, they invited me to give the invocation. Then they brought up about the issue of the cameras. And under that law, they were supposed to have this read in three meetings at the council before anything could become a law. But in an emergency, they passed it that night. 
And I can say today that because of the work that I was doing outside of just spreading the gospel, and when I saw that the Ferguson police were just putting in the camera this past week, this is my documentation. They've been having cameras in their cars ever since. What I'm saying is that uh, this word point man and being a man sent by God, you cannot anticipate everything you're going to get involved in when you are doing the will of God. I was placed on a committee called the uh, uh, Human, uh, the Image, uh, 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 the Mount Vernon uh, Image Committee. On that committee, I was the chairman. I had the Mercantile Bank president as one of my co-workers. I had a white man, he had uh, a printing press, and we three had to work together what you say, well, what is the image committee? There were many things in Mount Vernon that gave Mount Vernon a bad image. Let's say, for instance, General Ty there was the, is the biggest employer. Then General Ty had 2,200 employees and 50 blacks. That was a very bad image. My job was to go and try to find out why. How did you come up? with this ratio. Quite naturally, I began to think of racism. And there was some racism. But my secretary worked at General Ty, and she ran, she was the second shift superintendent, she ran the second shift. The chairman of my deacon board, he had worked there 20 some years on the assembly line. When I began to investigate, I found that it was not hard for a black to get hired but the blacks didn't want to work. They would get hired, and they didn't want to sell drugs, and didn't want to do the work. Quite naturally, they got fired. Mount Vernon was a town that the blacks depended on uh, welfare. Long generation, grandparents, when I first became pastor, one of the old mothers of the church and said, Pastor, be careful what you say about any blacks in Mount Vernon because we all kin folks. Illegitimacy and no work. Dropping out of school, very few blacks friended high school in Mount Vernon. The school superintendent called me one day and wanted me to uh, give a motivation speech to the high school kids at the school. We had a talk. I went at the appointed time to give this motivation speech. And you want to know what I talked about? You remember the 10 P's of success that Janet made so uh, uh, interesting to the kids here when they were finishing high school and going, going into college? I mean, finished and going into college. Well, I used those 10 P's in 45, say, prior plan and prevent poor performance. Then I used the second team, and I used the Apostle Paul as an example. And when I finished, the kids gave me a standing ovation. The school superintendent said, thanks, we needed that. I didn't go to Mount Vernon for that, but they came with being a pastor. I could go on and on about the things that I had accomplished. When I left Mount Vernon, I feel like I had failed God. I was on five boards, our directors, and I had got so tired and worn out doing things that I didn't go there prepared to do. I started a program, Racism, Kids and Cops. It's, in the, it, 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 it's documented here. I, had, I talked to the police chief, the, the uh, uh, fire chief, the sheriff and told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to have a, 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 a picnic, special day for the kids. And I want the uh, uh, policemen, the sheriff, the uh, 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 farmers, 
and all to be there. Those that was on duty, I wanted them to stop by during the day. But I wanted all those off duty, I wanted them to participate. I wanted them, we had t-shirts, black and white name, and I had them cross that say, let us grow strong, let us grow and be strong together. And we had many meetings with the uh, uh, police chief and the firemen. And finally they agreed on what, uh, what I was saying. And we had that picnic. I told the policemen that I wanted them to wear their uniforms. But I wanted them to be playing games with the children. I wanted them to be putting t-shirts. We had several boxes of different sizes. And I want some to be measuring the kids and putting the shirts on. I want some to be reading the key with the kids. They had an old, uh, not an old Camaro, but a Camaro they had taken from some drug dealers. And that was a big thing in Mount Vernon. They brought the Camaro, had the doors open and the black kids in and out of the Camaro. They brought the canine course and were trained, children and kids with the dogs were trained for. And I told them when it come time to eat, I want the policemen and the farmers to serve the kids. And that was such a successful day. Many people in a small town, television crew, newspaper, city judge, and the judge asked me, I'm strong, where did you get these ideas? I, said, I don't know, I didn't come here to do this. He said, well, we've been needing something like this a long time, but we just didn't know what to do. Today, the business people are taking over, and that is an annual event. They got rides, big picnics, and the whole works. But what I am saying is that being a pastor takes more than just preaching the gospel. Now, the gospel is the main thing. If you go to Mount Vernon today, and you go to what is called the city municipal building, and there are some pictures on the wall, and guess who one of those pictures you're going to see? Me. Hmm? My picture is on the wall of the municipal building in Mount Vernon. Because of the work that I had done there, being on five boards of directors, when I would go to the Mercantile Bank, after the bank and I was closed to have a meeting with the bank president and the uh, printing press man, I would ring the bell and security would come by 5.30 and open the door to let me in and usher me up to the boardroom. I get there about 10 minutes early. The bank president would always come in after I sit there and he says, uh, Reverend, I'll be with you in about 15 minutes. I got some more things to tie up. But he always bring me a soda. And there I am sitting at that long leather table, all of those high back leather seats. And I said many a time, I'm a long way from the cotton fields of Mississippi. God blessed me beyond measure. One year I was a, over the Billy Graham crusade and I had to go to churches in about a 25 mile radius. And that was the most experience. I had an opportunity to preach at all of those big white churches in Mount Vernon. I never did preach at a Presbyterian, but the Methodists, the Baptists, the non-denomination, Pentecostal peoples, okay. I had the experience, a professor from uh, 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 Carbondale, he came, he said, I have seen you introduce himself. I've seen you on TV. I have heard you on the radio. And I hear about all of this preaching and teaching that you are doing in Mount Vernon. He said, but I wrote a book on the Bible. And I would like for you to read my manuscript before I publish it. And I want you to give me your honest opinion. He left the manuscript. I kept it for about three weeks. When he came back with a big smile on his face, and he says, did you read it? I said, yes, I did. He said, what did you think of it? I said, not much. So the smile left, and he says, uh, why? 
I said, well, like you said, that you don't know me, I don't know you. But you wanted me to be honest with you and give you my honest opinion. I said, you put the church too far under the law, and you sound like you as a seven-day Adventist. He said, I am. I said, that's your problem. <laughs> law and grace do not mix. But what I am saying, that God placed me there for a purpose. My primary job was to teach the, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never did shine that. But I got involved with so many things that I didn't anticipate. And when I left Mount Vernon, the city officials, let me go back a little further. I built up this relationship with the mayor, the uh, 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 Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, with the uh, 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 chief of police. And you should be surprised at some of the things the chief of police White wrote about me in here. Whenever Dick Durbin would come to Mount Vernon, the mayor would always call me, Reb, Dick Durbin is in town. I want you, the first time, I want you to come up here and meet him. I didn't know, I knew who Dick Durbin was. But what was Dick Durbin and I gonna talk about? So I went, and we had quite a conversation. And every time he would come to town, the mayor would call me, Dick Durbin is in town. He wants to talk to you. When I left, Dick Durbin sent me a wiregram, thanking me for the work that I had done in Mount Vernon. The city of Mount Vernon gave me a going away reception at the city's expense. All the white churches, the big churches, all the city officials, they had me and my family sitting at the council table, had me sitting in the mayor's seat. My wife, daughters, and friends uh, sitting around the table. And the gift that they gave, uh, it was unbelievable. The mayor gave me the key to the city. The white asked me, please stay in my running. You have done so much to bring the races together. And it could not be done without you. But you know why I left my Vernon? The Lord said, you know, I learned that success with God is being where God wants you to be and doing what he wants you to do. I felt like that I had done what God wanted me to do, and the Spirit of God spoke to me so plainly, it is time for you to leave. There were several churches begging me, one in particular, to be their pastor. One church, if two and a, a block from us, the church had burned down, the biggest black church in Mount Vernon. When they rebuilt the church, they put a gym. The only black church in Mount Vernon today was the gym. The temptation was there, but I turned it down. When I came back to St. Louis, the committee came over here and begged me to be their pastor. When the church was dedicated, well, before the church was dedicated, they had me to come over and do a seminar one Saturday. Then when they got ready for the church dedication, they had me to come over and preach the dedication sermon. Before I left Corinthian, I had started a building fund for a new church. We bought a new van, a 15-passenger van while I was there. And one of the white pastors asked me, how did y'all get that van? I said, it was on sale up there in the Dodge place. And we went, and we bought it. I started a building fund for a new church. I left before the church was built. But the pastor that succeeded me says, if this church is ever built, you got to preserve preached the first sermon. About three years ago, some of you was there. Beautiful building is completed. I had to preach the morning and evening sermon. The Lord used me. And that district, it ran from Illinois, from across the river from Paducah, Kentucky, all the way up to uh, uh, Centralia. Many small churches on each side of the highway in a small town. I have the distinction of three churches in that district. When they needed a pastor, they called me and asked me, who would I recommend to be their pastor? I recommend three different preachers. 
And those three preachers is pastor today in those churches are well satisfied. Then one, the last one, was Parker, Reverend Parker in Centralia. I recommend the one that where I came from. I recommend the one who had the, uh, the built a new church with the uh, uh, gym. I recommended him. But what I am saying, I went there for one thing and got involved with something that I didn't, wasn't prepared for. But God worked it out. God worked it out, friends. There was no way, and I had not been trained in all of my seminary studying the Bible, I had not been trained in doing anything like that. But God knew the end of it before the beginning, and it was God who was working through me, not me. It's time to leave. I know that when I came back here, God had me to do it. But it seemed like I'm hearing another voice. Come over in Macedonia and help us. I'm praying that I will be led by the Spirit of God and what I do. But whatever I do, I want to be led by God's Spirit. It is no secret what God can do. What He has done for others, He'll do the same for you. But we have to learn how to let God have His way. Huh? And I said in the beginning, salvation is number one. Notice what the Apostle Paul told the, uh, 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 Timothy. Pray that the leaders will be saved. It is not the will of God that any should perish. 2 Peter 3.9 said the same thing. There might be some leaders in government that are not saved, in which they are. But our job is to represent and tell them about the saving power of Jesus Christ. Hmm? I don't care how bad society might be. Somebody's going to be saved when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody is going to be saved. Don't get discouraged because you cannot see the numerical number. How long did you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ before you accepted? Huh? None of us here knows how many people we have led to the Lord. But the issue is, are you telling the unsaved about Jesus Christ? Huh? One day the Lord is going to go to give us a reward. Yeah. Huh? Not for how many souls you won for Christ, but because you are a soul winner. Huh? Some of your government officials don't expect them to live as a Christian if they do not know the Lord. Notice what Paul said. Pray. Huh? In order for a person to pray, you have to know the Lord and have a personal relationship. The question is asked sometimes, do God hear a sinner's prayer? A sinner can utter some words. And it might make him feel better because he thought he was praying to God. But the Bible says that you cannot come to God for any reason unless you go to the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit. He don't have the personal relationship with the Lord. He don't have the Holy Spirit. And you cannot go to God for prayer unless you go through the, go through the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was working a young white boy, we used to call him a hippie. And he says, uh, Armstrong, 
I know that you are a God sent man. He said, and I don't believe in Christianity, but I pray when I get in trouble. But it seems like my prayer don't go to, to no higher than the top of this building. I said, they don't go that high. <laughs> if you don't believe in the Lord and you pray when you get in trouble and live any way you think you're big enough to, you're doing something I can't do. Hmm? Pray. If you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord, or even if you're living in sin, you have a uh, fellowship have been broken if you are saved and living in sin. But if you are not saved and you never had that relationship, then God does not hear you pray. You might feel better when you utter some words. My job. My job. And all God has blessed me to do. Number one is tell the unsaved no matter what you have done, no matter what you are doing, God is not concerned about the have been. God is concerned about the now, what you are now. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. Whosoever. And I'm so glad that I'm a part of the whosoever. Huh? Yes, I do some things that is wrong. But come to our Wednesday night class and hear Brother Davis and myself talking about broken fellowship have to be restored through 1 John 1 9. Examine yourself. Are you doing the will of God? Are you saved? Huh? Are you concerned about knowledge? There is one thing in this world. Other people might not like you and they might not love you. But if you have knowledge, they will respect you for that. Hmm? Knowledge is knowing. And once you get knowledge, can't nobody take it away from you. Hmm? You can go out. I used to tell the ch young people that in my running, Whenever you see a highway being built, they need concrete finishing. Whenever you see an automobile coming off the assembly line, they need some mechanics. Whenever you see a high rise, they need some iron workers, and they need some what we used to call tractor drivers, but now they're heavy equipment operators. But you've got to go to school to learn how to operate them. They need plumbers. They need... Uh, 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 electrician, pipe fitters. But if you are not qualified, you are left out. Stay in school. Get knowledge. You have something to put on your resume. May God bless you. May he keep you.